Hi again. Welcome to the lecture series on dental trauma. This topic will be covered in three lectures and today we are going to look at the first part. So first let us see what are our learning objectives. Our learning objectives are four as you can see on your screens. So we are basically going to learn about uh, triage. We are going to learn about how to do an emergency evaluation of a patient who has sustained dental trauma. We are also going to look at the etiology of trauma to teeth and supporting. How does the trauma happen? What kind of trauma will produce? What kind of injuries? Then we are going to classify the injuries and so, uh, trauma to the supporting uh, structures. And finally, we are going to look at the uh, clinical guidelines and the protocols in the management and prevention of dental injuries in both primary and permanent teeth. So in this particular lecture, that is the dental trauma part one, we are going to look at the etiology and some introduction and the classification before we go on to how to do an emergency evaluation. So it's important for us to understand what are dental injuries and how they are classified. So moving on. First, we define trauma, which is referred as an injury or a damage or an impairment or external violence producing injury or degeneration. So trauma could be it's basically a generalized term. In children, the maxillofacial injuries are more common and more challenging to treat basically because we need to have a child's cooperation when you are managing. So in terms of behavior management and in terms of their different physiology, the different, uh, their difference in anatomy, uh, in terms of primary teeth and permanent teeth. So it, it's challenging in terms of both the child's behavior and the complexity of handling the situation and of course the whole thing is complicated by the fact that parents are feeling guilty that they were not able to protect their child from injury and therefore a part of counseling also comes into play. To give you a rough overview dental trauma which is trauma to the tooth which can be trauma to the crown the root or both crown and root the dental trauma can be to supporting structures like the alveolar process the basal bone itself and both in combination of tooth and supporting structure so when we talk about dental trauma we are talking about uh, these kind of trauma and of course you will learn in oral surgery maculofacial trauma where we are more uh, talking more about fractures of basal bone and the management of those so for us we are restricting ourselves to the term dental trauma and we'll see why we are restricting ourselves to uh, dental trauma now, as you see on your screen, the prevalence of uh, different traumatic injuries in children are given. When you see the head injury is quite common, 40%. And injuries to the anterior teeth again are very common, that is 40 to 60%. So basically, when the children are growing, their uh, head in, is of a larger proportion as compared to the body. If you, you've already learned this in growth and development of children, that the head the size of the head is bigger so definitely when they have a fall the injury is mostly to the head and then of course the teeth and that is why it is important for us to know about dental traumatic injury in children and their management and primary dentition and permanent dentition if you can see both the dentitions are commonly affected but when uh, look in terms of individual teeth which are affected maxillary central incisors have the highest prevalence of fracture so in your clinic the chances are that you're going to see traumatic in dental traumatic injury to maxillary central incisor followed by mandibular central incisor most commonly so why tooth fracture is more commonly seen in children so basically it's because of they are prone to falling down and when they are trying to learn to walk and they're trying to climb on things and then they're trying to explore their environment they uh, tend to fall down and because they do not have a very good neuromuscular uh, reflexes at, uh, because they're still growing so they're not able to uh, protect their fall or protect their body from falling down so that is why the fall is very very important uh, cause of uh, fracture or dental traumatic injuries in children otherwise as the children grow older right and these children are more now prone to having accidents like bicycle accidents or falling off the swing uh, is more common and of course you will realize that once they start to learn and walk around and then they try to explore the environment and then they uh, accidentally fall down then children even grow older in their teenage sports injury becomes very common 
form of uh, dendrochromatic injuries or especially while playing football or during the karate or taekwondo practice or even during swimming we have seen cases where the child has you know fallen uh, in the swimming pool by accident and hit his face on the side of the pool and fractured his teeth so if you see uh, these are the most common uh, injuries and are closely related to the age group that you see in them battered child is uh, can be talked individually where it's a clinical condition where the child is uh, being subjected to physical abuse and it is uh, a topic of itself and we will discuss about the management of battered child more when we talk about uh, child abuse and neglect but here it is important to mention that the children with facial injuries must also be looked on suspiciously and trying to find out whether uh, the child is suffering in physical abuse by the hands of the caregivers or either of the parents so we have to be alert on that too and lastly we have uh, other miscellaneous causes especially in children who are uh, uh, mentally challenged and children with cerebral palsy they are not able to coordinate their muscular movements and then they are again prone to falling down and when they are trying to explore their environment uh, children under general ncc also get their uh, teeth fractured during intubation where you use the laryngoscope to intubate the child and this laryngoscope sometimes uh, traumatizes the maxillary incisor leading to fracture of the incisor or even luxation of the incisor so these are also very common cause for uh, especially in children uh, going under general anesthesia so if you look at the predisposing factors children below 6 years are more prone basically because of their uncoordinated muscular activity and their skull and frontal bone is more prone to injury because of they have uh, the developmental uh, the stage of development uh, predisposes them because they have a bigger head as compared to the other uh, parts of the body the, the proportional proportionally it is bigger and of course boys uh, and the girls they almost have the same uh, prevalence of uh, injury so we can say more boys are marginally more prone to uh, having dental injury now between the age of 6 to 12 the predisposing factors are outdoor games and maxilla because it is more protrusive the mandible is still growing and still having the forward downward and forward movement uh, displacement so the maxilla gets the brunt of any injury to the face and mid face and anterior teeth are more prone to injury and here the boys are now start to have more prevalence of dental traumatic injury essentially because of more adventurous um, sports and more aggressive sports that they uh, want to play as compared to the girls and we also have uh, malocclusion as a predisposing cause of uh, traumatic injuries to the uh, teeth children with increased overjet with protrusion of maxillary incisors and insufficient lip closure and you can classify them as angles class 2 type 1 uh, malocclusion or angles class 1 uh, type 2 malocclusion so these two malocclusions are prone to injuries developmental defects which make the teeth uh, fragile because of the developmental problem in the uh, organic uh, portion that is your enamel or dentin so particularly dentinogenesis imperfecta because dentin is uh, imperfectly mineralized the enamel has less support and the enamel wears off the dentin also wears off and any traumatic injuries can cause uh, fracture of the teeth easily special groups like mental retardation and epilepsy uh, children from uh, broken homes and who are homeless uh, they are more prone to traumatic injuries and any pre existing caries also weakens the crown and any slight uh, force on the tooth can fracture the crown away so these are some special groups that we need to um, be aware of so factors characterizing an impact to the teeth so if you see on your slide the shape velocity mass direction and the type of impact influences what kind of the injury the child will have and depending on the force is whether absorbed by the crown of the tooth or the root of the tooth or the alveolar process of the tooth or the force is equally distributed between the crown and tooth you will have different manifestation of injuries like crown fracture root fracture crown and root fracture crown fracture with subluxation and things like that so we will see in the classification how they are uh, classified as
So one of the basic uh, and easily understandable classification is Ellis and Davies given in 1960 by these two uh, people. Uh, very simple and very easy to follow. So we'll first look at this uh, then before we go on to a more difficult one. So we have Ellis and Davies and its class uh, is characterized in class 1 to class 9. So class 1 are simple fractures of the crown involving little or no enamel. So as you can see in the picture, let me get the highlighter, uh, the marker, uh, the pointer for you. So laser pointer here. Yeah. So you see here, this is the minimal enamel fracture. And as you see here, pictorially, the fracture involves the only the enamel and little enamel. So this is classified as class one. Okay, so we have class one and then we have class two. In class two, the injury is little more severe than the class one, where you have your uh, fracture of the enamel and fracture which exposes considerable amount of dentine but does not expose the dental pulp here so you see here the dental pulp is still unexposed so this is called as class 2 then we have class 3 in the class 3 the injury is a little more severe where you have fracture of enamel with fracture considerable exposure of dentine and exposure of the pulp chamber so if you see here the pulp is now exposed so this is classified as 3 clinically that is how it will appear so you'll wonder why it's not bleeding it is not bleeding because the pulp is not inflamed and that is why it is not bleeding so any if this was inflamed the bleeding would have taken place so you will see as class 3 with pulpal exposure then you have class 4 which is a traumatized teeth that becomes non-vital with or without loss of crown structure so sometimes blunt injuries will cause pulpal degeneration of the tooth and they will cause um, internal calcification which will appear exactly like this yellowish discoloration all right and uh, this yellowish discoloration must be differentiated from grayish brown discoloration with which means that the pulp has undergone necrosis and here if you see yellowish discoloration that means this tooth has been traumatized and now it's showing internal uh, calcification and therefore it is turned yellow all right so the treatment is different for both okay so this is differently treated tooth which is grayish brown because of pulp necrosis the treatment is different so this is called as class 4 class 5 is uh, tooth that is lost as a result of trauma that is avulsion so avulsion is basically tooth which has come out of its socket so that is how it will appear clinically the tooth has avulsed that is what we call and this is classified as class 5 Class 6 is fracture of the root with or without loss of crown structure. So if you see in the radiograph here, okay, there is a discontinuity here. So this is a horizontal fracture of the root, okay, in the middle third. So this is classified as class 6. So we have um, the apical one, uh, apical half and then you have the crown half. So if you look at the root, it is one third here and apical two third. So this is classified as 7 is displacement of the tooth without fracture of the crown so here the tooth is intact there's no fracture of the crown or the root but the tooth is displaced either it can be labially or it can be lingually so here in this particular situation particular picture the tooth is being displaced palatally okay so this tooth is more uh, labial this tooth has gone palatally impacted so the tooth is intact but the alveolar process may get fractured and the root may get stuck between these two and it's called and it's very difficult to um, get the tooth back into its normal position because the root is wedged between the two bones here so this is class 7 so it has its own challenges when managing then we have fracture of crown n mass so if you see here in the picture the, there is an n mass fr crown fracture so basically very difficult to restore and this is class Class 9 is traumatic injuries to the primary teeth. So remember in Davies, Ellis and Davies classification, class 9 is given for traumatic injuries to the primary teeth. It could be anything. It could be fracture of the enamel, fracture of enamel dentine, fracture of enamel dentine pulp. It could be horizontal root fracture. It could be end mass fractures. All these for primary teeth is grouped together as class 9. While class 1 to class 8 is only for permanent teeth. So this created a lot of problem when classifying because we need to give additional information for class 9. 
So what WHO did, it came out with a better classification. So this is the classification by WHO. And it is mostly based on the anatomy and therapeutic and prognostic consideration uh, of the dental injury. And it is applied to both primary and permanent. So you can classify either primary dentition or the permanent dentition you include uh, using just the, the WHO classification. And then code number is used according to the international classification of diseases. So every tooth uh, injury has a classification code number. Okay, so what WHO says is classified injuries uh, into three categories. The first category that you see on your screen is the injuries to the hard dental tissues that is enamel, dentine, cementum and the pulp. So this is basically just to deal with the hard tissues and the pulp. So first one is called enamel in fraction and this is the, the code for this kind of injury according to the international classification of diseases. So enamel infraction is basically a crack in the tooth, right? And this is not visible clinically. Only when you put a translucent light uh, illumination from the palatal side, you will see an uh, incomplete crack. Uh, it's not even fractured. So it's a crack. So this is called as enamel in fracture. Then we have the enamel fracture per se. And we call this as an uncomplicated crown fracture. So uncomplicated because the pulp is still not involved. Okay, so we call it as uncomplicated crown fracture. That means we must understand a part of enamel has fractured and that is why it is uncomplicated. Then you have uncomplicated fracture which can involve enamel and dentine. So if I were to classify this disease according to WHO, I would call this, call this uh, condition or diagnose this condition as uncomplicated crown fracture bracket enamel and dentine. So this is how it will appear. So it's still uncomplicated because the pulp is still not involved. So can you can you think of the next slide that I will show you when the, uh, the fracture involves enamel dentine and exposes the pulp? Can you think of the diagnosis? Yes, it will be called as complicated crown fracture. So when I say complicated crown fracture, that means Complicated means the pulp is now exposed. Crown, that means enamel and dentine is involved in the fracture. We can also have an uncomplicated crown and root fracture. So remember when we talk about crown, we are talking about enamel and dentine. But when we talk about uncomplicated root fracture, that means something like this is more like a vertical involving enamel dentine and part of the cementum that is why the root fracture comes into picture and this is classified as uncomplicated crown and root fracture and similarly we can have a complicated crown and root fracture so here in this diagram if you see enamel dentine is an exposure of the pulp so this is classified as complicated crown and root fracture now i want you to remember these terminologies because in your exams in your oskis in your um, uh, question paper we will be asking you to draw a diagram of a complicated crown root fracture so I'm expecting you that you will have an understanding that what does a complicated and a crown root fracture would mean so when I say crown and root I'm looking at fracture of enamel involving enamel dentine and cementum so if you draw something halfway through and without involving the cementum then I will understand that we still have uh, learning to do in this part okay so try to remember all these and try to draw diagrams to remember them so let's move on so now we will have just the root fracture okay so this is basically the root fracture the horizontal root fracture similarly we saw in Ellis and Davis also is classified differently so this is a fracture involving dentine cementum and pulp so I can call it is as now root fracture cannot be vertical root fracture it can happen so we will, can only call it as remember crown and root fracture uncomplicated crown so, but here it is a root fracture directly now similarly we had the injuries to the heart tissues and the pulp so the other category of WHO is called is the injuries to the periodontal tissue that is the supporting tissues okay so in this particular group of disease the crown is not fractured the crown and the root are intact there's no problem with crown and root only the 
supporting structure that is the periodontal space the bone is affected so the first one in this classification is concussion now concussion is basically an injury to the tooth and supporting stru structures without abnormal loosening or displacement of the teeth that means the tooth has been violently shaken within its alveolar socket and that's it okay so it's just basically the tooth is stunned with no uh, looseness or no displacement of the tooth then we have subluxation now, subluxation is basically loosening an injury to the tooth and supporting structure with abnormal loosening without displacement of the tooth so after the injury the tooth will have a grade one uh, mobility or a grade two mobility so we say it is just subluxated the tooth is just moved in its cavity uh, in its alveolar socket just violently and because of which some part of the periodontal ligament has been severed some of the ligaments have periodontal ligaments have been um, torn and that is causing the tooth to become loose in the in its own alveolar socket so this is called as subluxation we can have subluxation and then we can have an extrusive luxation extrusive luxation means the tooth has moved in the alveolar socket and in the outward direction so it's partially displacement of the tooth out of the socket and that is why out is extrusive so here in the picture you can see the tooth has moved that is why it is luxation and extrusive because it is moved out so similarly can you imagine of a situation what would be called if the tooth has moved in the socket but in the apical direction what do you think it would be called as yeah it will be called as intrusive luxation. okay now this intrusive luxation and this is lateral luxation that means the tooth has not gone into the apically or occlusally it has moved laterally so that means you can see here the tooth has moved on the buccal direction uh, tooth has, the crown has moved in the palatal direction the root has moved in the buccal direction with the fracture of the alveolar process so this is called as lateral luxation so it could be in the palatal direction it could be in the labial direction and this is the intrusive luxation that i was talking about so it's called as central dislocation the tooth has moved in the socket and is basically driven into the bone okay so such tooth are very firm and have a metallic uh, feeling when uh, test on uh, when tested for percussion and therefore we will learn all this when we are learning how to diagnose but for the sake of classification and understanding the terminology we are doing this with you today so this is called as intrusive luxation so we can have intrusive luxation we can have extrusive luxation and then we can have lateral luxation so the tooth can move in all these directions and then we have x articulation that is what is avulsion the tooth has completely come out of its socket so this is called as x articulation now we this is the third third group of injuries which is injuries to the supporting bone right here the alveolar process and basal bone we are talking about so we in this one we have first uh, injury which is called as a comminution of alveolar socket which can be mandible and maxilla and you can see here there's a difference in the coding right so basically it is a crushing or a compression injury of the alveolar socket either in the intrusive or lateral luxation so basically the bone gets crushed when the tooth is moving the tooth has moved because of the injury okay so just remember this is crushing injury of the alveolar socket we can have fracture of the alveolar socket per se as you can see here this tooth has got a lateral luxative injury okay the crown has moved and because of which the root has moved labially and fractured the alveolar process this is very common in maxillary teeth because of the thin label uh, alveolar process okay so in this case we will call it as a fracture of alveolar socket again if you see there is diff you can call it mandible or maxilla or when you're writing you can write a different code then we can have the fracture of alveolar process per se so here you see the fracture line is here so basically the alveolar process gets detached from the basal bone okay so this is called as fracture of the alveolar process then you can have the fracture of the mandible and the maxilla basal bone all right and this can involve the base of the mandible or the maxilla or often in combination with alveolar process as in a jaw fracture and fracture may or may not involve alveolar socket so we can have a different combination lastly we come to the injuries of the soft tissue so first 
category was injury heart tissue second was periodontal um, structure third was the bone and the fourth one is injuries to the gingival and soft oral mucosa so in this you can have laceration of gingiva or the mucosa where there is basically tearing of the mucosa from its uh, sub mucosa so the epithelium is torn from its supporting sub mucosa so this is called as lacerative injury and you can also have contusion of gingiva where there is a blunt impact to the soft tissue and therefore you have bruising that means the internal capillaries will get uh, torn and they will leak blood into the mucosa which will later appear as a bluish discoloration so this is called as contusion of gingiva so this is basically bruising usually by an impact from a blunt object then we can have abrasion of the gingiva abrasion basically means it not uh, it's not a tearing away of the epithelium from the submucosa it's basically tearing away or scraping of the soft tissue so so maybe the top layer of the epithelium has been uh, rubbed off so this is called as an abrasive uh, injury and it can happen to the gingiva it can happen to your oral mucosa okay now this this photograph just tells you that how adventurous fathers can be right if not the children and the father and we can have a mishap where the child gets uh, uh, hit on the face by the side of the bed or by side of the uh, side table and things like that can happen right so we have to also uh, look at these kind of adventures for the children so just just to show you that uh, things can be adventurous for the parents and the child but disastrous for the oral tissues and a big big management of the injury challenge for the treatment. okay so let us just quickly summarize what we have seen uh, in today's uh, presentation we have looked at the different classification and these classifications are not compartment tight we can have two injuries presenting at the same time and therefore who classification is more easy because you can write the whole thing uh, the classification can be used for primary or permanent and then if you want to just go for more simpler one Ailes and Davies can also be followed okay so depending on what we follow in the clinic so here in PIDC we are following the WHO's classification so here we write down incomplete so uh, tooth 1-1 having uncomplicated fracture involving enamel and dentine okay so that is how we write it in here in PIDC so it depends on your clinic where you're working so you'll be familiar with classification we have also looked at the different prevalences of the of the traumatic injuries why traumatic injuries are more common in children we have also looked at what are the predisposing factors and therefore when you are doing counseling for the mothers who bring the child for anticipatory guidance we have to counsel them for these kind of injuries that can happen in the future and therefore precaution has to be taken okay so this is the end of the uh, lecture one and i will see you in lecture two uh, in the uh, next presentation all right okay have a nice day and see you all later